talking about in submission to their own husband as unto the Lord. And uh, believe it or not, I'm not really done saying all that I wanted to say about that. And if the ladies say, oh, that he's picking on us. Uh, ladies, let me just tell you that when it comes to husbands love your wives and the things that God says to the husbands to do, I don't want to be here for that. <laughs> uh, there's nothing worse than reading the scriptures and realize that you thought you were doing some pretty good things and realize how short you came when you compared yourself against the word of God and realize there's, there's areas of development that need to be done yet. And, uh, and I'll tell you, I don't want to be here when I preach on that subject. Uh, but, but there are just some practical things that we want to consider and other verses uh, that relate to the subject. In fact, last week when we studied Ephesians chapter 5, I, I, my desire was to make a comparison be, between verse 21 and verse 22. And we never even did finish reading verse 23 and 24, which is part of the same subject. So allow me to read to you, beginning in verse 18, uh, down through about verse 25, and then we'll, we'll pick up on our subject today. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting your, ourselves, yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is, is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that we will be spirit-filled today, that we'll be filled with the knowledge of your truth, and our heart will take it in, and our heart will say, yes, this is right, this is honorable, this is what I ought to do, and that we will allow your spirit through your word to lead our life, and we'll live to your glory, and we'll do it rejoicing from the heart. And we thank you for guidance on how we ought to live throughout life. In all these different areas that we'll cover in Ephesians 5, bless them to our heart. We ask in the Savior's name. Amen. Last time together, as I said, we talked about the difference between verse 21 where it says submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, which is the third uh, expression that's given here of being spirit-filled. And that's everybody submitting one to another. And then verse 22 becomes very particular when it turns and addresses the wives and tells them to submit themselves unto their own husbands as to the Lord. And I pointed out to you that it seems like a husband has a ministry, a man has a ministry broader in the area of submission than a woman does, in the sense that the woman particularly is pointed out to be in subjection to her own husband, where the previous verse talks about being in submission one to another. And we can look at that in a general sense and realize all of us need generally to be in submission one to another, learning from Philippians, that is, to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, uh, but to, to, to esteem others better than ourselves and serve one another with, a, with the mind that Christ had when he served us. Uh, but in verse 22, we come to the wife, and then the Bible addresses the wife. And this is not the husband to, to tell the wife anything. This is God talking to the wife. And we talked about her being in subjection to her own husband as unto the Lord. Um, when we did that, uh, what we were doing is pointing out real Clearly, what we're talking about is spirit-filled women, a spirit-filled wife in particular, that she, as she reads verse 22, she hears God speaking to her. And if verse 18 is talking about being spirit-filled and doing the will of God from the heart, then it's God talking to her about some things that she needs to settle in her heart. We know from Ephesians chapter 2, in, in the first few verses there, that you can either be filled with the spirit of this world which is really the, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works in the children of disobedience, you can be filled with that kind of spirit, or you can be filled with the spirit of God and knowing what God would have for your life, and the choice is yours. And, and the Bible speaks particularly to the wife in, in verse 22, telling her where he would have her to be in relationship to her husband, 
and that she is to do that as unto the Lord, that it is her way of glorifying the Lord, not just glorifying her husband. He's not, she's not doing it for his sake, in fact. She's doing it for the Lord's sake. This is for God's glory. Now, we live in a world that would look at that and say there's something wrong with that, that that, that, that is not the way that a woman ought to behave herself. And what we're doing is calling on people to be responsive to God and to realize what God said. But also, we went a little bit further than that. We studied and realized why God said it. We went to Corinthians to point out what Ephesians says right here in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Uh, and then the conclusion is, therefore, the church is, uh, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be subject to her own husband in everything. And, and what we did is we looked at the reason that the God has a design in this, and I would just end to begin today with what I ended with last week. What we did is we went all the way back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 before sin ever entered into the world. And we saw God's perfect order and design of purpose in creation, in marriage. How Adam saw his need of a wife and then God gave him a help that was meet for him, perfectly meet, so that they together can do what God commanded them to do and that is to have dominion over all things. We looked at that and my goal back then was to show you that there was a pure, perfect harmony and God's just just God's perfect design in marriage so that when you look at marriage and you look at these things you'd see God's beauty in it rather than the world saying there's something wrong with this you'd see it's God's design and his order and it's it's perfect then sin came in in Genesis chapter 3 and sin always confuses things in fact we were talking about sin being the cause of guilt the cause of shame the cause of fear the cause of chaos the cause of confusion and the cause of conflict and certainly there was a conflict in the marriage of Adam and Eve after sin entered in. And yet it was still God's design to lay out the order of the headship of the man and the woman being subject unto the man because now, because there's a sinful nature working in them, they'll try to work contrary to God's order rather than naturally living God's order. So he lays it out for them and the order doesn't change when sin entered in. It's just that sin is going to cause us not to do what God naturally wants us to do and therefore what we're going to have to be in order to do what God wants us to do now is to be spirit-filled. Not filled with the spirit of sin, not the spirit of self, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God. And know that what God initially designed will still work if we'll let it. And notice in verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, see that word? So let the wives be subject unto their own husbands and everything. Now, we've got to let God work in our life. And we've got to realize that his design and his order is still right. And if we'll, if we'll give in to that, rather than having conflict in our life, we'll have the fruits of the Spirit working in our life. And, 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 and rather than a life of chaos and a marriage that's got full of conflict, we'll have a marriage that is working properly as God had designed it to work. So we first saw the beauty before sin entered in, and we saw the purpose, even though that sin entered in, God's purpose is still to have the headship, the man ruling over the woman in a husband and wife relationship. And then the final thing that we did is I asked you to realize what God always asks us to do, and that is to learn to walk by faith. Not by sight, not by feeling, not by what other people tell us. Walk by faith, read God's word. He said this is the way that it ought to be. Even in a sin-cursed world, it's still the way it ought to be. And now what you need to do is not walk by sight, but walk by faith. And walking by faith is not only reading what God said. When we talk about doing it from the heart, it's to trust God to believe that he's right. And if you just do what he says without trying to understand, and, and even if your own impression is that it, it isn't the way it ought to be, just trust God to be right, you'll have the fruit of it being right because it, it'll manifest itself as being right. It'll be what the Bible says, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we ask you to, to walk by faith according to God's design and see if it's not the best thing for you as a, a woman married to a man to be this kind of wife that's described in Ephesians 5.22. Well, you say, well, if you said all of that, uh, what is there left to say? Uh, what, what, what there's left to say is just some practical things. And I hope you just bear with me today as we just kind of think a little bit and look at a couple other passages of scriptures. Because if you're going to see the beauty of God in it and you're going to see that God's purpose still works in a sin-cursed world and is the way to relieve the conflict and the chaos and the fear and the, and, and, the, and the guilt and the shame and all the rest, 
that's just to follow God's will and to walk by faith, you know what we're back to? We're back to submission. If God said it and you decide in your heart to do it and you're going to let this be, then isn't that what submission is? It's just, it just, okay, God said it, and now you're going to submit not to the man first, to the word of God first. And then the word of God says, submit wives to submit yourself unto your own husband as to the Lord, and you're back to the idea of submitting unto the Lord. I do believe if we go back to Acts chapter 5, that Gamaliel said it right. And when you talk about submission, you can either do what God said and find out he's right and enjoy the fruit of it, or you can work against God and you'll be defeated. Look at, look at Acts chapter 5, and I know Gamaliel's not dealing with husband and wife relationship. We don't even know if Gamaliel's saved, but he knows, he knows something from studying the law about the character of God, and he's absolutely right in what he says. And, and we're not, we'll not even try to dig out the context of how he's saying it, but look at Acts chapter 5 and look at verse 30, uh, 34. You'll see some of it from there. Acts 5.34 says, Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. I take those words and I'd say, as a woman is debating for following the Lord in an area where the world tells her, don't, don't, don't go by that Bible. You know, when I, when I marry couples, I, before I ever marry them, I have a talk with them, and, and I, I'll only let one word be submitted. When I ask the woman, will you love, honor, honor uh, and obey till death do you part? The only way, I'll, uh, the idea of obey, the Bible talks about obeying her husband, it's there. But if she'd rather have the word submit, I'll replace it with the word submit but I will not drop those words. She has to pledge in order for me to perform the marriage to love, honor, and obey, or to submit till death does she part. He is to love, honor, and cherish till death does he part. And, and I won't perform a marriage that, that, that a person isn't agreed. I mean, you're not going to start a marriage right if there isn't an established headship before it all starts. And, and, and I read these passages of Scripture, and Gamaliel, realizing that these men are about to do some things against the apostles, said, now, you, you just better wait a minute concerning what you intend to do with these men. You better think twice. And that's what I say to each one of you. Before you make some decisions about how you're going to be in your marriage relationship, whether you're going to obey God and submit to what he said, or you're going to fight against him, you better think twice. And here's why you better think twice. Look at verse 38. It says, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone for if this counsel or this work be of men it shall come to naught but if it be of God ye cannot overthrow it lest ye happily be found even to fight against God and any time in your life you're struggling with the will of God and, and doing your will or God's will uh, think about that verse because if it's of men, what's going to happen to it? It's going to become of naught. That means it's not going to exist. Men, the thing that men think they're going to accomplish, don't, they never accomplish it. And if it's a contrary to God, it can't be accomplished. And in a marriage life, if, if, uh, if God's will and design isn't followed, the marriage will come to naught. It won't be a marriage anymore. And, and that if you think that you can do contrary, but if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found to fight against God. If you fight against God's design, will you win? Absolutely not. And, and so this is what our intent was last week, is to show you the beauty of God's design and, and teach you that it still works, even in a sin-cursed world, and now encouraging you by faith to follow it. And that is, what, that is nothing more but submission first to God, to his word, and then to, to go on and, and do what he said to do, and that is for wives to submit themselves unto their own husbands. Now, now in the light of that, I'd like you to think about the great victory that there is in surrender. You realize that there is great victory in surrender? I don't know. I, I, I have always known that the victory is there, but if you have been with us in the book of Matthew as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a real lesson there, or a great lesson there, the Lord Jesus in his humanity, knowing he's about to taste of, the, uh, of the, the wine of the wrath of God on that cross, 
as punishment for our sins in his humanity, prayed to the Father to let this cup pass from him. It didn't stop there. He said, but not my will, thy will be done. He prayed it with such tears that the Bible said he sweated great drops of blood. And the Bible says that he prayed it three times. And after that, he got up and he said to his apostles, I must drink of the cup. And you know what happened? The Lord went to the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity, knowing he's facing something that you and I can barely understand what he faced, prayed it three times before God and got up and said, I must drink. And what he did is he totally surrendered to the will of God. I must drink of the cup. Okay, let's go do it. You know what that is? That's victory. He no, he's no longer sweating drops of blood. He's no longer in agony. It's over. It's settled. I'm going to do what God said. And surrender is the greatest victory of your whole life. That is surrendering to the things that God said. Uh, the, there, there's great victory in that. The Apostle Paul, it said in 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, went three times and prayed before God about the infirmity of his flesh. And God says that in your weakness I'm made strong. And Paul wiped his hand and says, Most gladly I'll rejoice in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. If I've got to be this way, I've got to be this way. Let it be. I think of the apostles who were encouraging Paul and, and, and those, who, uh, those who followed Paul, not the apostles, but those who followed Paul, encouraging him not to go to Jerusalem. They couldn't persuade him. And finally they said, Well, God's will be done. They just gave up. There's great victory in giving up and surrendering to God's will. You know, if you fight against God, you're never going to win. But there's a great victory. There's a peace in your life that comes when you finally realize, this is right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to quit bucking it. I'm going to quit doing what Paul said that he was doing before he got saved, kicking against the pricks. Sharp gourd behind the, the foot of, a, of an ox that's there, and if they try to kick their master, they, pick, they hit right against it and, it, and and the harder they kick, the more it hurts them. And that's exactly true. Anytime you're fighting against God, it hurts you. There's great victory when it comes to just surrender. And, and that's what God is asking us to do. It gets rid of the, the guilt. It'll get rid of the shame. It'll get rid of the fear. It'll get rid of the chaos. It'll get rid of the confusion. It'll get rid of the conflict. And you know what it replaces it with? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's what comes through victory of giving up. So as we consider this, don't fight against God, surrender to it. Submission frees you from, from decision-making uh, and, and the responsibilities that come with it. You realize, and Mike Berry would <laughs> relate to this, that if you realize uh, uh, that in a, in a position of authority, and Mike's run a business, but even now he's in the sales position, and... Uh, and there's a lot of uh, responsibility put on someone in that kind of position. There's other people that's going to eat whether he sells or not. And, you know, when you're in that position, sometimes you think, boy, I'd like to be the guy just on the assembly line. All i got to do is put a part in, put a part in, put a part in, go home after eight hours and go to sleep, not have to worry about it. But the guy who has responsibility, there's a weight on his shoulders. It's there. And, and, and that, that responsibility is given to the man in the home. And what I'm trying to say to you as a wife, not only is there great victory in surrender, but also in the idea of submission, there's freedom from the responsibility of decision-making. You can rest in the fact that God's not going to hold me accountable for the decisions of this family. That's not my place. My place was to be submissive. He's going to hold me accountable for that. But the guy who's got to carry the authority, the guy who's got to carry the responsibility for the decision-making, he's the guy that's got to carry the weight of those burdens. And, and uh, the position of the wife actually frees her from that. Society is trying to put her under it. Try, the, the, the society is trying to put a burden on the woman that, that God didn't design for her to carry, nor does he going to hold her responsible for carrying. And, and so there's a great uh, freedom then in, in submission. Being a help meet frees you from the burden and the responsibility that God lays upon the men. And now I'm not talking about the responsibility of decision making. I'm talking about the burden of the, the need of meeting the need of the family. When we get into what the husband's responsibility is going to be, we're going to realize that it's providing for the family. A wife, if she'll do her job of being submissive in the area that God tells her to be submissive, and her job is to be his help me. Well, isn't a helper someone who's got less duty than the person who's got the job assigned to him? Uh, men, we, we, we can never do it. 
without a good woman with us to be our help me. But the one who the responsibility is laid on is upon the man, and the woman can enjoy great freedom if she realizes that her job is to not carry the load, to not carry the burden, not worry about how everything's going to get paid and everything's going to get done, that her job is just to help along the way. What can I do to help? And then not carry the burden. When we talk about this, this is an area Sanjay and I have realized uh, is true in our own life, that she's reminding me of it. Uh, I told you some time back and, and that, that when we first got married, I never even had a checking account. Uh, it's not that I didn't know anything about the responsibility of bill paying, but Sanja always did, so she always paid the bills. All I had to do was make sure the money was there. She wrote the check. She paid the bills. Uh, but there came a time a little over a year ago that Sanja was the pressure of it all, was just building on her, and it was carrying on her back. Walked in one day. She hands me a checkbook, says, you pay the bills. I always wanted to learn how to do that anyhow, so <laughs> I, I, was, I, I was always doing a little managing of the money, but n and now it was just thrown at me. And I told you a few weeks back about our van breaking down and, and costing uh, so much and how it aggravated me, and all of you saw that. You know, Sanjay was never pressured by that. She was telling me this week, you know, that didn't bother me a bit. <laughs> you know what she did? Is she did exactly what these verses are saying. She's my helpmate. She works. She helps with the family. She helps with the income, always has. Even, even when the kids were smaller, she always had little jobs and little things that she did on the side as a help me. But you know what she don't have? She don't have the burden on her back. She don't, oh, it's got to be paid. The week's coming to an end. The month's coming to an end. Where's the money going to come from? How am I going to juggle this? It's not there. It was never supposed to be there. She gave it up. Great victory for her. By the way, <laughs> I don't want to cry on your shoulders. <laughs> they stole their car uh, on, uh, on, on Friday. Uh, she calls me, uh, I just got home, she says, uh, did you come pick up the car? <laughs> now, Uncle Les, when this happened to you three times, it was funny. It's not funny no more. <laughs> uh, so, if you happen to see our car driving down the street, will you call us and let us know? Uh, but anyhow, the, again, she feels relieved in the sense that it could be worse. She could have to worry about how we're going to replace that car. She doesn't have to worry about that. What I want you to see is in what God is saying here, there is his design and order, his right. You know, we so often, the men want to especially talk about the woman being the weaker vessel, don't we? And how we're macho men and all of this. And sometimes we turn around in society, and, and of course society says women can play football just like men can. They want to be equal in, in, in sports and all areas. And, and frame-wise, they're not made that way. But also emotionally and, and relationshiply, they, they, they're not, we're not the same. We are different. God designed for some of those responsibilities to be laid on the men, not on the women. The women to be the helpmeet. And boy, when you, when you do what God asks you to do, there's great victory. There's great peace. There's great relief in your life. Now later, men, we're going to talk about our responsibility as being men, and that's it's going to be heavy. Uh, but, but concerning women as well, I'd like also to go have you go with me to, first, uh, to Titus chapter 2, where we had our scripture reading. Because also when we talk about decision-making and, and, and responsibility, uh, those areas of responsibility God never put on the woman, and therefore it's not her burden to carry. But God does tell a woman where her, her main focus of her life ought to be. If it's not to pay the bills, if it's not to make the decisions, where is her main focus of life? And when you read Titus chapter 2, the, the, the understanding is it's home management. Home management. Look, look at verse 3. Titus chapter 2, verse 3 says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient, to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now this passage will talk about the young men, the old men, and talk about everybody. Right now we're concentrating on, on women and particularly wives. And it's the job of the older woman to teach the younger woman to do all the things that it says there, to be sober, to love her husband, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep her at home, good, obedient to her husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. 
women are to submit unto the Lord, uh, to, to submit to their husband as to the Lord. It's for his glory, isn't it? If a woman doesn't live the way God says to live, it's the word of God that gets blasphemed. It's, it's, they're going to think that what a woman's doing is what God said to do, and, and, and they'll talk against what God said. But if she does what God says to do, it'll draw people to say, you know, there's something special about this person. So a woman's job, according to that verse 5, kind of centers around what it says there, keepers at home. Keeping the home, the main area of responsibility. You get into all those dumb arguments. Does that mean a woman can't go outside the home? You know, how does she grocery shop? You know, we're not talking about she can't go outside the home, and we can even debate a little bit over how much she can work outside the home. Uh, when you get so picky to, to grab something and, and, and lock it in as if it has no context to it, you get some weird things as if a woman's supposed to be locked up in the house. Keeper at home is the one who keeps the house, guards the house. We talk about keeping the unity of the spirit. That means understand where our focus of attention is, guard it, and make sure Satan doesn't distract us from what God would have us to focus in on. What God would have the woman to focus in on is home management. The care of her children, the care of her husband, the affairs at home. That's where her, her, her mind has to be freed from all other responsibilities so she can care for that particular area of life. And, and, and that's where God would have the woman uh, to be involved with. And then, you know, when you talk about that, especially when the young kids are, or the children are young, the aged women are to teach the young women to love their husbands and to love their children and to be discreet and chaste and so forth. Uh, by the way, I, I tell Lynette how to be chaste. I heard, uh, uh, who was that? Clyde Pilkington at a conference. Was, I never thought of the word chaste this way. Uh, he says, you know, chaste, you know, we understand it means to be chastised, to, to keep yourself pure, uh, uh, self-discipline is the idea the but but he made a point about the King James word chase is the man is supposed to chase the woman and these days the girls call the guys you know that don't you and I've been reminding Lynette that her job is to be chase let the guy chase you Lynette he will <laughs> he'll chase you let him chase and you just keep running for a long time yet <laughs> but but let him chase and, and uh, that's really, uh, the women do those kind of, that kind of teaching, but since I had that knowledge, I passed it on. Uh, but you know, the knowledge there then centers around the wife in the home, and that's where go the, the husband has got other duties that he's got to do, so she's free to do those duties, so they complement each other. But then when the children r grow up, don't forget what this passage is talking about. When it talks about these things to teach the younger women, it's talking directly to the older women. And I think this is where our society has lost. I mean, if we try our best to, do, to, to try to keep uh, focused in on the home, and Christians are getting back to that, uh, the world has lost it. They got their women go out and got their own life. They got their own course. They got their own purpose in life, their own occupation, their own goals to achieve apart from the home, bringing conflict to the home. And, and that's what society is doing. But we're, really, we're going back and focusing in on the home but we've got to remember that the aged women, your number one responsibility before God is not now that you're done raising your kids, your job's done. It's the aged women's job to turn and to help the younger women make it through those early years. And here's where I can finally learn to speak and understand God's word from experience a little bit. There is at least five years when women just start having children that the married women go through a very hard time, and I can't describe it. Sanja went through it. Other girls from our assembly went through it. And the ones who are now just now having babies, they're just going through it. It's an area of life that I realize a husband can't fill. There's, there's some needs they have. Sometimes the mother's not the best one to fill it because, you know, there's always a conflict between mother and son-in-law or mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or mother and daughter-in-law. Uh, there, there's conflicts within homes. But there is a place for an older Christian woman to attach herself with a younger Christian woman and help her through those times. That's what this is talking about. It's talking about the aged women, not to say, okay, my job's done, gone. Hey, we are submit one to another. Where's the ministry to others? You know, when I, I took Sanja away from Florida when, we were, when Kevin was just one year old, and there was a lady, not her mom, a lady apart from her mom that was very instrumental, actually prepared Sanja for her whole life, and that is the pastor's wife in uh, uh, First Grace Church, no, First Baptist Church of Griffin Road. Gray-haired lady. That's what an aged woman is, right? Gray-haired lady. 
This lady, by the way, Kevin, they wanted to call you uh, Clarence after your grandpa and to nickname you Clay. That was her advice. We didn't follow that. <laughs> but, but she was one who was always there kind of giving little advice, little direction, someone very close. Always, she was the pastor's wife. Sanja hand, uh, hung around with the pastor's daughter, and she actually prepared Sanja to be a pastor's wife. But then, you know, here's Sanja, one-year-old child, move away from mom, move away from the Christian fellowship. We come here, and there was very little fellowship at that time. Uh, just family is what we had, and that's what got her through. Also, I'm involved in the ministry, and I'm away, but there's a need that she had I couldn't ever fill. A husband's not made to fill it. If she needs an older uh, a friend, an older woman in the faith, who can come and say, now forget what the world's telling you that when you're all depressed, what you need to do is have your own life, get a babysitter, go out and get a job. You don't need a woman stepping in your life to give you that. You need an older woman to come in and teach you how to love your children. Yeah, you lose a little patience sometime, but just bear with it. It's only five years or so, and you're past it, and you start to enjoy your children, and, and this, this, the hard time will end. You need her to be there when the husband, he doesn't ever seem to fill the need of the wife. Well, men are like that. Just keep loving him. He'll come around. And they do. You need that. I'm so pleased with what the Lord has done in our ministry. You look at the age group that's sitting here. What a multiple number of age, huh? We can meet each other's needs. But I tell you that you younger women, you need to make a friend of an older woman in the faith. And your older women in the faith, you need to take some time. Look for those younger ones and say, hey, by the way, I'm available. Take her to lunch. Start it. That's the way it'll happen. The whole management, that's the area that God would have for the woman in the life. And whether it's your management or teaching the younger how to manage their home, that's the other area of life. Um, let, let's, let's look also with me in one last place. Enough to practice for a long time. But come over with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's Oh, wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> you, you go there, but then go back to Ephesians. We've we got to cover those verses. 1 <laughs> Peter chapter 3. And, and hold your place there. Mark, mark the passage and come back to Ephesians chapter 5. I don't want to talk to the ignoring of the scriptures. And we read them. I just want to remind you what this says here. Ephesians chapter 5. We'll look there first. After it says in verse 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and, the, and he is the Savior of the body. You see that verse? I, I, I mean, it, it amazed me. I, it's making a parallel between the woman and the church, and as the church is subject to Christ, she's supposed to be subject unto her husband. But when it names Christ, notice it says two things about Christ. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, sometimes when we talk about wives, submit yourselves unto your husband, what, what, the reason that rubs wrong is because what we're talking about is positionally, governmentally, authoritatively, the husband is to rule the home, and he's the head of the wife, and that's what these verses are talking about. But sometimes we don't balance that like the Bible balanced it. When it said that Christ is the head of the church, it didn't just stop there, did it? It says, and the Savior of the body. Head of the church is the position that Christ has over the church. Savior of the body is the relationship. Isn't there love in that? And that's what, when, when he says that, there's a reminder there in verse 23 that the husband is not just the head of the wife. When he addresses the husband, we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And the husband will be taught how to love his wife. But the point is, is the husband and wife relationship is not just head and submission is a loving relationship that's there too that needs cultivated that's part of the marriage relationship and when he points to Christ he's not just the head of the body he the head of the church he's the savior of the body the church is is the people that's a general that's a rule that's a government savior of the body is my relationship with my lord and the husband and wife are to have both those relationships they're to have the rule relationship but they're also to have the loving relationship between each other and the men have to be taught how to do that. The aged women can teach the young women how to do that. 
And it concludes in verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. See that word everything? Well, sometimes we say this, our minds immediately go, well, what if I have an abusive husband that says everything negative and tells me to do things that are contrary to God? He tells me I shouldn't go to church. He tells me he wants me to go to bars with him. Uh, what, what, what do I do about a husband like that? Well, how about if I say this to you? We can talk about that another time. I, I don't think we need to talk about it too long because the Bible always makes it clear that you obey God rather than man. If a man dis disregards what God has to say, your number one duty is to obey God. And, 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 and naturally, because we live in a sin-cursed world, there's going to be conflict to that, but those conflicts are, are, are rare to begin with. Uh, even still, with the society we live in, it's still rare, still rare. The second thing is, what God does here, when he says everything, it's our sinful, carnal nature to say, yeah, but, and look for an area that we can point out and say, I, don't, I shouldn't obey in this, this point. That's sinfulness. That's your sinful behavior. That's rebellion working in you. When it says in everything, in every situation, you ought to look and say, how can I be submissive to my husband to do the things he wants me to do without being disobedient to him or to my Lord? You ought to look at the way that the means to serve every way possible. Don't look for the area that you can say, point out, and try to be disobedient in. Look for every way possible to be obedient. That's where the scriptures is pointing. That's the kind of submission a man is to have with a woman. Now, the one area that I wanted to say in last, and that is when it comes to the area of husband and wife, and we talked about a woman and being submission in, in the... In the, in the uh, victory that there's there, the peace that's there, the concern that she's supposed to have in life, the one area of her own particular life as she is supposed to relate to her husband and all this, this submission, it's an area that the Bible calls attractive, of being very comely before the Lord. Uh, in, in, the, in this regard, think about Peter, would you? And perhaps women particularly. I think any woman here could fall in love with the Apostle Peter. I think so in the sense that if you really want to talk about a man, he was a man, wasn't he? I mean, whenever you talk about Peter, he's always ready to fight. Uh, but also, he was a, he was a man who, who know, knew how to love. He was strong, there's no doubt about it, being a fisherman, so he had the physical attraction that's there. But he, he's also outspoken, one who's not afraid to speak up. But what's the good quality about him? He's not afraid about being wrong. And when he found out he's wrong, he's willing to turn around. There's something special about a person who can admit they're wrong when they're wrong. But he was a leader. He, he, he was able to make mistakes and, and could rebound from it. The Bible talks about him walking away weeping and getting back up again. I think a woman would like a man who's extremely strong but able to cry. Able to make mistakes and admit it. Be defeated and still get back up and do what's right. There's something special about a man like that. Um, well, anyhow, you think about these concerns. I even think about Peter and his mother-in-law. Wasn't he concerned about the health of his mother-in-law? And he brought Christ for her to be healed? And there's something special about a man who doesn't just love his own mom, he loves his mother-in-law this way. Peter's a special man. And in that quality of Peter, I want you women to look at what quality, especially young ladies, to look at the quality that Peter looked for in a woman. And read with me, and you follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 3. A man like that likes a woman like this. And it's not Peter's what Peter likes, it's what the Lord likes. It says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, that, uh, uh, that if any be obedient, not in word, they may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That is, disobedient husbands who are not in the faith might by the quietness of their wife respond to the things of God. It says in verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating of hair and wearing of gold and putting on of apparel, not outward beauty, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. For after this manner, in olden time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter ye are, as long as ye do well. 
and are not afraid with any amazement. Ladies, you afraid to be the kind of woman God would have you to be because other women would make fun of you? Don't be afraid. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, having, uh, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, and be courteous. You know, when it talks about woman, and back up in verse 4, with a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is great price, that's, a, that's, that's very attractive, ladies. A woman, not submissive because she's less than somebody, just realizes before God where her, where her priorities are, where her interests are, where her duty is, serving that way. And, and whether a man sees it or not, that's in the sight of God of great price. That's highly valued. When Peter says this, I just say this in close, when Peter says this, you know what he says? Even the woman of old, and he goes all the way back to Sarah, who called Abraham Lord, adorned themselves this way. You know what Peter is saying in his day? The olden days, the women knew. The women knew what was attractive to God. It's as if Peter is living in a day when women were rebelling against the olden days. <laughs> and if that's true in his day, how much more in our day do we need to go back to what the Bible says on how things ought to be and what's attractive to God, what's beneficial for ourselves, and what's healthy for our whole families? God knows what's right. Let's trust him. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the reasoning that we can do from the scriptures. And we pray that none of us will choose to fight against you, that we'll take your design and your order and say it's right, walk by faith and reap the blessings. Help us to do that in every area of life. And we thank you for loving and giving us these information of how we can please you and how we can do well. In the Savior's name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to number.